Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you again this morning. And it's my joy to be able to just share something of God's word with you. Just as I've done in recent times, I asked Precious, who read our passage from John 2, just to share a thought that she had, having read God's word. And this is what she had to say. In verse 17, where the scripture says, Motivation to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire, refers to the church and the body of Christ. And it shows us that like the community that church brings can make us really find passion within our faith. Lovely, thank you. So the body of Christ is key and it needs to be the place where we go, where we are devoted, because that's where we will learn more and also we will be able to have a passion for our faith. So thanks very much, Precious. That's wonderful. Now, as I looked at John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, um, and did my research, I came up with this as a title, The Wine and the Whip. Now, you may say, well, that's a bit of a strange title, and it's a little bit dramatic. And yes, I actually just love this. Uh, contrast between the wine and the whip and I hope by the end of our message this morning you will have understood a little bit the contrast that I'm trying to bring to you. Take the wine as God's grace and take the whip as God's truth and that may just help us to understand a little bit what's happening. Now, the interesting thing is that through John's gospel, John was trying to achieve something particular. And what he was trying to say to the people then and to us now is that I have written these things. So these stories, these incidents, these events, the teaching that Jesus gave, I've given this uh, and written these things down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God, and so believing you might have life in Jesus's name. So basically, remember, he's trying to tell the people of the time that actually you were expecting a certain sort of Messiah, someone who would knock the Romans on the head and give them liberty and freedom to do their, their own thing. But actually, Jesus was coming to transform society. He was the son of God. He is the son of God. And when you believe in him, you'll be able to have life. And actually, you can have life now. You can have life that is transformed because of his power. And also you can have life into eternity, into the future. That's what Jesus is actually talking about through his acts, through his words. And so basically what's happening throughout all of John is that there is this great big arrow pointing towards Jesus, proclaiming that he is actually God confirming that actually what the scripture said was that the Messiah would come, he would be the son of God, and that he will be going back to God. Now, the interesting thing that John is pointing out is that actually before he returns to God the Father, he has an important mission to accomplish. And that mission was to reconcile people to God, to draw people back into good relationship. You see, the word reconcile implies that there's something wrong. And in order to correct that wrong, he has to mend the problem. And that's what his life and his teaching is all about. He is going to be the bridge. He wants to be the bridge. He is the bridge between people on one side who are sinful, who are fallen, who are influenced by things that are that are, that are bad for them, that are bad for society, and God, a holy God on the other side. Jesus and his death on the cross is that bridge. For those who receive Jesus, you will be able to enter into the presence of holy God. And so this is the message that is coming through from John to the people then and to us now. So the wine and the whip, I guess you could understand the whip part because that was quite clearly a fairly a dramatic element, wasn't it, of the story that Precious read to us. 
So where's the wine bit? I can hear you saying. Well, actually, the wine bit is the first part of the chapter. And although we haven't had time to read it, I do want to make this contrast that is so important for us. You see, in the first part of the chapter, um, before Precious read, it's the story of the wedding in Cana, where Jesus starts his public ministry, but he's in a family situation and his mum asks him to change the water into wine. Do something, she says. They've run out of wine. So it was a it was a celebration. It was a point of joy. And here Jesus demonstrates his goodness to that family. He demonstrates his love. Yes, he demonstrates his deity, his power over natural things. And yet in that particular story, we see Jesus blessing the people. We see his grace being poured out. And the wine is representative of joy and celebration so often in the Bible. And that's why you've got this contrast now between the wine where there was joy and blessing and love and and all that sort of thing with now chapter 2 verse 13 where the whip comes in you see what's happened is that the, the john and the disciples have moved from this village outside of jerusalem into jerusalem itself and it's the time of passover and there are tens of thousands of people who've come into this city for the passover festival and so now this big temple the temple grounds if you like unfortunately has now become a market worship has become commercial okay people from all over the world actually those who've um, converted to judaism would actually come it was it was an expectation it was a joy it was something they wanted to do but now what had happened was that in order to buy the animals they needed to sacrifice, it was becoming a bit of a racket. The high priest Annas and the other priests were all involved in this racket. People were having to buy pigeons and doves and goats and lambs and, and cattle at hugely inflated prices. They were paying a temple tax in a certain sort of money and they had to change that. And in order to exchange the money, they were paying over the odds for that as well. So the act of worship, this desire of people to meet with God had suddenly become something that was a money spinner. OK, and this is the context where Jesus walks in. You see, it wasn't normal. The temple hadn't been built for that particular purpose to be a market. It was a place of worship of God. And yes, it wasn't right for that to be happening either. And what was even worse was that the high priest and all the other priests were in on it. It was part of the scam, it was part of the racket. And you see many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people would have gone in and out of those temple courtyards and they wouldn't have thought, it's just normal, okay? We can't do anything about it, it's just normal, it's, it's, it's fine. And yet here in the first part of the chapter, Jesus has started on to his public ministry in the context of a family. Here we see him in the, at the start of his ministry, but he is in a very, very public place. He's not hidden. And it's here that he starts to exercise himself as the Messiah, this, that, this person, this saviour that God had sent to Israel. And so something stirs deeply within him. Now, remember, Jesus had been to the temple loads and loads of times before. Right, you know, as a, as a boy, his mum and dad had been to the Passover festival. They'd be, they were on their way home and they couldn't find Jesus. And when eventually they found him, where was he? He was in the temple. This is my father's house, he said. And so he knew the temple. He knew what it stood for. And yet when he walks into the temple courtyard this particular time, as he knows he's got a job to do, something stirred deeply within him. And he herded these people out. He herded the animals out. Now, reading that particular story or hearing that story read to us, it may have been a bit of a shock. Jesus acting in this way. 
But what we need to understand is that it's not a violent outburst of anger, such as perhaps I would have if I felt there was an injustice or somebody had done something against me or had hurt me or something like that. This wasn't a violent outburst. This was a, a considered move. He actually took time to make a whip out of string. And remember, in those days and in these days today, you can herd cattle and sheep and all the rest just by by whipping them, by tapping them and, and so on and so forth. And so keep in mind that this wasn't an uncontrolled violent outburst. This was a specific specific act designed to give a specific message. But I can also hear you say, isn't this Jesus, the same guy who a little bit later on in his ministry actually preached the Sermon on the Mount? You know, where he speaks of turning the other cheek, not reacting in anger, not reacting badly. He spoke about the, the strength of gentleness and meekness in somebody's character. Isn't this the same guy who now is, is wielding a whip and, and herding animals and, and people out of the courtyard? It's interesting, isn't it? There's something that has just touched Jesus's heart that has made him so angry that he fashions this whip. But the question really we need to ask ourselves is, is he being consistent with himself? If he's saying one thing but doing something else, that's no good, is it? It's not, that's not the sort of person we can believe in. What we need to remember is that so often we define God by one of his attributes. And usually the thing that we choose is his love, because that's the sort of thing that we like. It's the sort of thing that we can grasp a hold of. It's the sort of thing that we want in our hearts. But what we need to remember, and if you look at that diagram there, there are loads and loads of different aspects to God's character. And we can't define God just by one thing. For some of us, we may focus on his love because that's what we like. It's the sort of lovey-dovey, cuddly sort of God that we like. There may be others who focus in on his righteousness. Um, and his holiness. And we forget that actually he's a God of love as well and grace. Some of us may want to focus in on his justice because we see injustice all around us in the world. And we forget that actually he's a God who uh, is a God of love and he's a God of holiness. And he's a God of, he can forget our sins sometimes. So says the Bible. He's a God of sorrow, jealousy. He's omnipotent, he's patient, a whole array of different characteristics of God. And right in the middle there is his holiness. And so what we need to remember as we read this story, as we hear this story, that God's attributes work together in perfect harmony. So all of his different characteristics, they're working together for his purpose. And so, well, what is it? What is the problem here? What what did Jesus see here as he walked into the temple courtyards that really riled him, that that got to him in some way, that pricked his his righteous anger? You see, what Jesus is saying here in this story is you've you've lost your focus. Hey, guys, people are coming to to the Passover to worship God. They're coming to give sacrifices to to uh, ask for forgiveness for their sins. They want to focus in on God. And here you are turning God's house into a market. You've lost the plot. The focus of worship has been lost. And this is not what the temple has been built for. This is not the whole purpose of the temple being there. The temple is supposed to be a holy place. It's a place where God dwells. His presence is there. It's a place where God, where people can come and meet with God. And all of this marketplace business is taking away from the holiness of God. In front of you, you've got a picture of a whole load of shoes. And in certain cultures and in certain contexts, you would take your shoes off as you went into God's house. 
when I was a boy in India, we would take our shoes off as we walked into the church room or the church building. Why? It demonstrated a reverence. It demonstrated the fact that we were leaving, if you like, the things of the world behind us, the, the dirt of the world, and we were going to come into God's holy presence. So the temple was supposed to be a holy place. And Jesus here is pointing out the fact that there is a heartless mechanical approach to the worship of God taking place at this time. And actually Isaiah in his prophecy spoke the same sort of words too. He spoke of the same spiritual state that the people of Israel had got into. And he spoke on behalf of God when God said through him, I don't want any more vain offerings. I don't want any more sacrifices because you don't mean them. You don't want forgiveness, really. You're just going through the motions. You're doing what's necessary. You're doing it because it's socially accepted. I can't take it anymore. So Isaiah had already said that to the people. And here Jesus is saying the same thing. He's giving the same message. Grace, the wine, and truth, the wit. There are times when God's love and his need of truth clash together. But actually, it's all part of God's character. And so often, the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we making Jesus too small? You see, a one-dimensional, loving cuddly sort of Jesus isn't actually true according to the scriptures. Jesus is bigger than our one dimension. Yes, of course, he is full of joy. He's the one who gives us joy. He is full of goodness. He's the one that wants to impact our, love, our lives with love and good things because he is a loving God. And that's that element of grace. OK, that's his grace that is demonstrated to us. But and this is the big but he is also concerned about cleanliness in our lives, both morally and ethically. He wants us to be right. And this is the truth, the whip bit, if you like, chasing out those things that are untrue, that are ungodly, the things that don't uh, please God, the father. And so truth is just as important for him as a loving God, as his goodness, as his forgiveness. And here in this particular picture, you see a scale, the balance scales, and you've got to get the balance right. The balance of grace on one side and truth on the other. If you've got too much of the emphasis on the love and you're not worried too much about the truth, then there's a problem there. If you're too much worried about the truth and not worried enough about his grace and his love and his goodness, then you've got a problem there as well. And this is the point where it then says, well, hang on a minute. What relevance has this story of Jesus cleansing the temple? What relevance has that got to us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul actually says, you are God's temple. The spirit of God dwells in you. So basically, we, we don't have the temple in the same way, the physical temple that we read in this particular story. But what we now need to understand is that actually God dwelt in the physical temple in Jerusalem by his spirit. He is now dwelling in every single one of us. And so Paul is actually reminding us, don't you know that God's spirit dwells in you? And so just as Jesus's passion was very, very evident, his zeal, his desire to cleanse that physical temple in Jerusalem in the story, we now need to understand that that same zeal, that same passion, that same desire for holiness and rightness and truth is also directed towards each one of us. That's amazing, isn't it? Okay, Jesus, his passion and his zeal and his grace and his love and his goodness 
and his desire for truth and holiness are also directed towards us now. And so through the Bible, through the Gospels particularly, we have this beautiful pattern coming through. This pattern that first he transforms. So just as he transformed the water into, into wine, so he wants to transform lives from the way they were into something new, something different. And once he is transformed, just as in the order of this particular story, he then cleanses. And it's important to grasp a hold of that, that he first transforms and then he cleanses. Because so often we think, oh, in order to be able to come to Jesus, we need to be clean already. And so the question we have is, do you have to clean yourselves up in order to come to Jesus? And the answer is a resounding no. He will take you as you are. It's incredible. You see, if you first come to him for transformation, for conversion, for a change in your life, and you accept him into your heart and say, yes, I want you to be the bridge. Then he will do the work of cleansing in your life afterwards. As you walk that walk of discipleship, as you understand more of his expectation, as you read more of his word, that cleansing will or should take place. First transformation and then the cleansing, this wonderful pattern. And again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple? The Holy Spirit is within you. You are not your own, for you were bought with the price. And so glorify God in your body. And that's basically what Jesus was saying. Hey, look, guys, if you're going to come and worship God in the temple, do it in spirit and in truth. Do it in the right way. Do it with a heart that is fully committed, not just going through the motions, not doing just what was expected. And the same thing for us. If we're going to follow God, if we're going to follow Jesus, remember that the Holy Spirit is, is within us. And we need to glorify God through our actions, through us as temples of God. Just still referring to this beautiful pattern, you see, back in Malachi, one of the other Old Testament prophets in chapter three, it's an amazing link, actually. He refers to the messenger that is sent to the temple. So again, he was talking about Jesus coming. And in that chapter, he refers to the refiner's fire and the launderer's soap. In other words, there's a cleansing that's going on, a refining that has to take place. And that's what Jesus did. As he went to the temple, the messenger went to the temple. He refined the temple. That's where the whip came in as he cleared the cattle and cleared the marketplace. And so the same thing for us, the messenger. Jesus is coming to his temples, us now. And following the refining process that is part of this truth, this whip, if you like. It's then that we'll be able to bring offerings in righteousness in a way that will be pleasing to God. And so the thing is, just as Jesus did that cleansing of the temple, that chasing out of things that shouldn't have been there because they were blocking the worship of God, he needs to do that in our lives too. You see, Jesus doesn't just want half love. He doesn't want us in church or at the end of a Zoom meeting, you know, singing or praying or going through the motions in this way just because it's expected of us. He wants us to be committed. He wants us to, to give 100%. He wants us to give our love to him. He wants us to be dedicated to him. You see, he brings us grace, the wine, but he also wants the truth, the cleansing action of the whip, if you like, of chasing things out. Just at the end of this message, I'd like us to pray these verses from Psalm 51 as a prayer. They were actually a prayer of David as he became conscious 
of his sinfulness, of his failings before God. We too need to be conscious of our sinfulness and our failings to grasp a hold of his grace, yes, but also to open our hearts up for forgiveness. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen.